We request our brothers uh, to please approach the front of the uh, front of the prayer masala. All brothers in the back, please uh, make your way to the front. <laughs> Inshallah, we will begin shortly. <laughs> Just like to request all the younger uh, generation, please come forward uh, towards the front of the first stuff. Please, everyone, come make your way to the front. Dear brothers, please make your way to the front, have a seat. As soon as everybody quiets down, inshallah, we will get started. Brothers, inshallah, as soon as everyone quiets down, we'll get started. There are a couple of kids in the back that are running around. If the parents could please uh, address them. Uh, so inshallah this is the part one of the Q&A, uh, inshallah we will have another Q&A tonight between 8.45 and 9.15 and directly following that Q&A we will have uh, the dinner for tonight. So starting off tonight's uh, Q&A, right now this is going to go on until 7pm. Um, At 7pm inshallah we will have the Aisha prayer followed by Quran recitation and then the final uh, speech of the night. Um, again, after the final speech of the night, there will be the question and answer session part two, followed by dinner, and then followed uh, after dinner, there will be a open session with the general ulama that are here visiting us, as well as our local imams, and they will be here um, after the dinner, uh, starting 10:30 uh, until um, there is no end end time to that. It just depends on when uh, everything wants to wrap up. But for that session, we request only ages, uh, brothers ages 16 and older. All other younger kids must uh, not be included in that gathering just because of the content of the discussion might be more adult than, uh, than kids. So inshallah, we'll, we'll begin the question. So I'll just uh, give you this. You can, you can, you can read them. My Q&A format is very quick. My answers are very to the point. Uh, where did his wife, where did Rasulullah's wives pass away? Where did his children uh, pass away? Uh, Nabi Sallallahu had a lot of wives. A uh, majority of them passed away in uh, Jannatul Baqir and are buried in Jannatul Baqir. Khadiza radiallahu anha is buried in Jannat al Mi'na, Mu'alla, uh, and uh, I believe Maymun radiallahu anha is also buried uh, uh, on the outskirts of uh, Mecca. Uh, where did his children pass away? Majority of them, uh, all of them actually, are buried uh, in uh, Jannat al uh, uh The next question. How about our earlier generation who did not have the chance of practicing Islam? How will they be judged by Allah on the Day of Judgment if they have done mistakes? I believe this is talking about the previous generations like parents or grandparents who perhaps were not practicing. 
Uh, so the question is, how about our earlier generations who did not have chance of practicing Islam, how they will be judged by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on the judgment day if they had done mistakes? So I, I guess I want the brothers and sisters to be a little bit more particular about your questions, a little bit more detailed, because when it speaks about our earlier generation, does it speak about those who have passed away or those who are still alive, you know? Uh, maybe an individual lived their entire life in disobedience and now it's time for them to, uh, you know, the end of their lives are coming and of course we never know the end of our lives, but they are reaching the age that, you know, it's more likely that we are about to go. Uh, but I'm taking this question as if it means that for those who have passed away, I, I would take this question as because it does not clarify this, so I'm going to take this question as those who actually passed away and did not have the chance of participating. Islam, it, uh, yes. I was the one who asked. Oh, you wrote that? Okay, good. Uh, the question was like, uh, uh, before our Islam was like established, before uh, Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was like, uh, uh, he was like uh, doing the word. So what happened to those generation like who were uh, practic practicing different? Uh, uh, okay, that, excellent. Jazakallah. Thank you for clarifying this. I totally told her this question to be something else. Uh, so our brother's question is that before the coming of the Nabi of Allah Sallallahu and of course the Prophet would be given to him, the people who passed away before the Nabuwa of the Prophet Sallallahu Wasallam, what would be their condition? So I, of course one of the greatest things could be an example of the parents of the Prophet of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, or the individuals who passed away before the Nabuwa was given and granted to the Nabi of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So how would we realize and how would we find out? So as we know that a time frame where the Prophet is present, an individual who is living must obey, their, uh, must obey the commands of Allah subhanahu wa the Prophet of the time. If a Prophet leaves the world, and of course when Sayyidina Isa alayhi salam left the face of this earth, there was a huge gap of approximately four, or approximately five to six hundred years of no Prophet being there. So as we see that the birth of the Prophet of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi approximately took place at 570, approximately in so-called. So now for the 500 years, the people who came, what will happen to them? <clears throat> so the scholars have mentioned that individuals were made to live their life according to the teachings of the past prophets. So long as they lived in the, in the way that the prophets had taught them, they will be perfectly okay, even though there was no prophets at that specific time. The time when there is no prophet, and this is an empty period between the coming of the prophets is known as the time of Fakrats. The time when there is no prophets between them. Seeing the life of the Prophet of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi the scholars and all these scholars of, uh, in, uh, agree upon this, and this is the aqidah of the belief of the, of the Ahl Sunnah wal Jama'ah, that the prophets of all the Anbiya and, and the parents of all the prophets and Anbiya were on the clean and straight paths. So the Prophet Sallallahu mother, father, and of course the lineage continuing towards all the way towards Adam Alayhi Salaam were all on deen and right paths. Now individuals who did not find anyone, uh, and no one came to them to teach them, and they did not find a message, what will happen to them? So there's a quick thing, I apologize, as Mufti Sahib says, he gives quick answers, my thing is, I, I have to speak a bit more, but forgive me for this. So scholars have mentioned that if there is an individual upon whom there is no message ever brought to, what will happen to them? There is a kitab known as Nurul Ida. Oh, no, 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 no. There is a kitab in, in, called Asul Shash, which speaks about the rulings of fiqh. In that kitab, it gives an example which I will share with you just to give you a quick answer. They say, imagine a child who was on a boat with a mother who was, uh, you know, she was holding the child in the womb, meaning the, birth, the child wasn't born as of yet. The mother was on a boat. This is an imaginary situation for us to comprehend. The boat wrecks itself. Everyone dies. The mother stays alive on an island. She gives birth to a child. When she gives birth to the child, the mother also passes away. So now there remains a child which is born in an island where there's, reach, reach, where there's no individual to ever meet and greet this person. This person lives their entire life without any message, without any information, without knowing Allah Taala, without knowing Islam, without knowing the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. How would this person be judged on the day of Qiyamah? Scholars have mentioned that there is an ayah of the Quran which is an answer to this. And the answer is 
in the changing of the heavens and the earth, the days and the night, there are answers for those who have intelligence. So scholars have mentioned a person who never received any profit to them. But if once in their life they saw the sky and they said, there must be someone who made this. Or they saw the moon come every day, there must be someone who made this. They saw the sun come and it starts every day in their life. They thought in the creation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, even not knowing that it is Allah who made it, would be sufficient for the maghfir and the forgiveness of those individuals. So for those individuals upon whom there is no message ever brought, but once in their life they recognize the existence of the Creator, they will be forgiven by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But of course for those the message was brought, and then they rejected, there is no salvation until they do not accept the truth, and of course the commands of Allah and the Prophet of the time. Hopefully that is clear. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Just one thing, a lot of these questions are asking about uh, how was the Prophet of love to children, uh, how was he with his wives, uh, did he cry, did he smile, uh, and uh, if Mufti Sahib gives permission for this, um, I think those questions, uh, we can, we can leave that for the seminar because a lot of those topics are going to be discussed uh, as far as how he's with his children, his wives, you know, so on and so forth. Uh, and uh, more, other, more, more uh, some things that are not going to be discussed in the seminar or relating to someone's talk, that's more beneficial in the sense that, you know, we'll be able to cover that. But if we're talking about the same thing here and then again in other sessions, it'll become redundant. Um, we had a question over here that... Uh, Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Since our Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam didn't have a son, so there was his uh, so there was his name taken since he is a Nabi. But when we normal people become pregnant, is it correct to ask for a boy? Uh, like if we have only daughters and no sons, people say our lineage won't continue. Kindly put some light on this. Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is the only person in history whose lineage con uh, continues through his daughter, Fatima bint Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Uh, after that, even generally, when a person is considered a Sayyid, their father has to be a Sayyid. Uh, their father has to be from the lineage of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi uh, not their mother. Uh, second of all, is it permissible to ask for a boy? Yes, it is permissible to ask for a boy. It is permissible to ask for a girl. Uh, this is what you ask Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala, and this is your heart's desire. Uh, and uh, I think Mufti Saab is still selecting his question, so I will just answer another. Regarding the lineage of a husband and in-laws, if, if your husband and in-laws are not happy with the fact that you don't have, a, you can't have a male child, Allah grants whom He wills boys and whom He wills girls. There's nothing you can do. Allah gave the Prophet no boys, so and that was Allah's desire and Allah's will. If anyone and has not and does not have boys, that's fine. You are acting upon an involuntary sunnah of Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam. What better, what better uh, comparison can you have? Is it permissible in Islam to prevent pregnancy? I wrote a, a, a thesis or a, a paper, not really a thesis, a, a research paper for Amja. Uh, if you Google my name and uh, a clear explanation to abortion, uh, there's, a, there's a detailed answer on there. It's a couple of pages. You can view the different uh, opinions on there. Salam, sometimes when we talk to our friends, I know he is not telling me the truth. Should I continue talking, uh, which, uh, which will make him lie more? If you know somebody's lying, to continuously talk to them and make them lie, you're only hurting yourself and emotionally putting yourself in that situation. Uh, most people, yes, we should all be very honest and truthful, but the reality of friendships and people are not at all times can they be honest. Uh, that should not be held against someone, for whatever reason they are, it's a very broad question, but if you are on purpose trying to lock them in and make them say more and more lies, then you're the culprit behind that. Most, uh, this question on. في سيرة المنتهى لما كلم رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم الله سبحانه وتعالى هل كان بينه حجاب أم لا was there uh, a barrier between Allah and Nabi صلى الله عليه وسلم when he spoke uh, according to some narrations there was no barrier this is a question I want to take about two three minutes on uh, and I just want to t take a little bit of time and I can say this answer this question and I don't think Mufti Farhan Sabr can answer this one it's because he's not uh, he's, he's an Imam of a Masjid I'm not an Imam of a Masjid I'm not an Imam <laughs> He's a religious director. <laughs> Most masjids in America have no structured learning, and their masjids, uh, in their masjids, so basic fit classes, hadith classes, aqidah, history, etc., for adults isn't the, uh, uh, isn't there. Is this a, isn't this a problem that needs to be addressed? Yes, it is a problem. Uh, Mashallah, Mufti Sahib is one of the few scholars you know that I know in America uh, that is handling so many masjids properly. 
right? He's going around in different places, and mashallah, you know, the entire... I was just at someone's nikah yesterday, and the person, he's my friend, but he's telling me that I wish Mufti Farhan was here to perform his nikah. And uh, so, you know, it's, it's, uh, he's, he's in the hearts of the people, the youth, the young, the old, and the reason behind it is, is because he has the leeway and the position in his masjids to go and promote and do as he wills. The biggest problems in our masjids and why our imams uh, are not doing programs for people, the, pro the problem lies with the community. You, nobody says that, hey, I'm going, I sent my kid to a college and my college is not learning, my kid's not learning anything because the teachers are all there are bad. No, the teachers are there, they teach properly and dedicated and they have a professional manner of teaching. Why? Because they're funded properly. Our communities will make a $7 million masjid, we'll make a $5 million masjid, we'll make a $3 million masjid. Our Imam said, mashallah, his salary is $30,000, $40,000, he's on food stamps. We, we know the brother, do it, then fi sabirillah. Yes, doing something for Allah and doing it free are two different things. Think about it. Doing something for Allah's sake and doing it for free are two different things. You say, brother, you know what? I went into the Hajj and Umrah business and I'm doing it for Allah's sake. That's good, mashallah. You know, I could have done any business. I'm doing Hajj and Umrah for Allah's sake. No, brother, your Hajj package should be free. How can you take? How can you take money? It should be free. In in Islam, at the beginning days of Islam, there was a Beit al-Mal, there was a treasury that funded the scholars and funded them well. Imam Malik, rahimahullah, he used to wear a new garment of clothes every single day, and he used to wear the best kitta. People see these scholars; they're impressed. They feel an attachment and longing, they have respect for them. If you have scholars from back at home, uh, or uh, are imams, they're not well kept, uh, you know, they, have, they go home, they have financial problems, the, you know, the, the, their, their wives, they can't buy their wives jewelry, they can't do anything for their families, their kids, they can't get them clothes, they can't send them to proper schools, they can't, they can't even go back to their own schools. You know, the big, one of the biggest problems is when scholars can't go back to their own schools where they studied from, to get spiritual enlightenment. Just the way the scholar in your community is giving you spiritual injections and giving you spirituality, that scholar needs to go back to his own school or another school or Haramain or Hajj or Umrah or somewhere to recharge himself. And if you constantly drain him out and you constantly uh, abuse the scholar and you don't have you don't have respect, I, I'm not familiar with any masjid or anything, so I'm being very straightforward. I'll be very straightforward, right? This is the reality. You want to go, Dr. Saab, mashallah, mashallah, you know, it's really good. We want our children to be a doctor. Morana, yeah, what is he going to eat? He's going to die hungry. And then, mashallah, if Morana is driving a nice car, oh, that's where my zakat money went to. <laughs> Everything is not your zakat money. You know what? People need to take care of them. I'll be flat out. I drive a 300 Hemi. I don't know, Mar Mustafa, but we don't have Ferrari, Lamborghini. <laughs> right? You keep honor for them, you respect them. People are going to, people, they will, they will be in a position to give back more to the community. So if people are destroying our Islam, it is the communities ourselves. Because we don't choose to support our Imams. Mufti Sahib, mashallah, you know, Imam Sahib comes, Imam Sahib, don't talk about Masai. Imam Sahib, this is not your responsibility. No, Mufti Sahib, mashallah, he makes the calls. He makes the decision of what happens. He orchestrates the programs. You go into Long Island, one man is having this program. That, all these programs that you're hearing in the past couple of weeks, who's doing it? One man, why? It's because he has that for, uh, he has that open thing. No, I, I know you shouldn't praise somebody in their face, but this is reality. This is reality, why? It's because we, that we can know how to make a successful community. And this is how we know that we can go and this is how we should structure our communities. MashaAllah, you have Marna Usman after Saab in your community. Uh, and I studied with him in South Africa, right? I know him on a personal level. He is much of a gem of a person, you know, as far as akhlaq is concerned, ilmi is that is concerned, knowledge is concerned, you can utilize him. So specifically if it's for your community, you have you have you have you have you have a treasure chest. How much wealth you take from this treasure chest is up to you. And much you have other scholars coming up, Morna Mamun and other scholars that are from, from this locality, take benefit from them. Don't look at them as your children. Don't say that hey they're budget. They're not budget. Allah gave them what Allah took away from everyone else. Ibn Abbas was a child, 15 years old. Umar radiallahu said, stay in my mashwara. Everybody said, he's the, he's the age of our grandchildren. The other big sahaba. Ibn Abbas is so small. Hold up. He asked him a tafsir question. Nobody know the answer. Ibn Abbas knew it. He said, you see, you don't know it. He has that knowledge and he has the tools. You can be older than him, but he has something more valuable than you.
the question is what is the importance of love of the Prophet Sallallahu And of course we cannot emphasize upon this enough. Uh, the importance of the love of the Prophet Sallallahu is the true essence of one's Iman. No one's Iman can be complete until they don't love the Prophet Sallallahu more than themselves, their wealth and whatever they have. Allah Subh'anaHu Wa says in Surah Tawbah, chapter number 9, verse number 25. That O Muhammad Sallallahu say to the people, قُلْ إِنْ كَانَ آبَاؤُكُمْ وَأَبْنَاؤُكُمْ If your brothers and your fathers and your sons and your tribes and your families and your wealth and your wives and your houses and your businesses, a thing Allah Subh'anaHu Wa counts and says if they are more beloved to you than Allah and His Rasul and to struggle in His path then wait for the wrath of Allah Subh'anaHu Wa to come. So truly the essence of our Iman is the love of the Prophet Sallallahu None of our Iman can be complete and faith cannot be complete until we do not love the Nabi of Allah Sallallahu more than ourselves and whatever we have. How did the Prophet Sallallahu show kindness to others inshallah? I think uh, Musa will cover this tomorrow as well. Uh, what was the, the manners of the Prophet Sallallahu to the love of the children inshallah Musa will cover that tomorrow. <coughs> Question is, we have a lot of loans upon us but we keep asking Allah Subh'anaHu for forgiveness. And we have a full intention to pay back. Will Allah subhanahu wa forgive us? Will we still be uh, suffering the punishment of the after uh, we die? As in Islam, there is a saying that the Prophet sallam wouldn't pray salatul janaza over those people who had debt. Jazakallah uh, for that question, and may Allah subhanahu wa make it easy for you to pay off these loans. And may Allah subhanahu wa make it easy for every one of us, inshallah, to, to do this. There are many mujarrab a'mal and actions from the life of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa which Rasulullah sallallahu would actually recite and he would even teach the Sahaba to pay off debts as well. So inshallah, I can always share with you inshallah on a private way inshallah and individually. Uh, another thing is when a person is involved in wrong and sin, so long as he or she feels the grief and the pain of that sin in their heart, indeed Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will forgive them. The hadith of the Prophet of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam mentions that the doors of Tawbah and the repentance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala are open hatta yugharghil until the last moment of the breath which is inside of a person. Until your last breath, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala can forgive our shortcomings. Yes, we might be involved in something which is wrong, but if we do truly from the depth of our heart have the feelings of asking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgiveness, Indeed, most definitely Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will forgive and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will indeed insha'Allah make things easy for us. Um, since we are the children of Adam, are we children of a female? I don't get this question. Uh, I read in my tafsir that if we are successful in this world, you will not be in the day of judgment. Uh, is this true? Uh, this is also, I think, uh, the way that sometimes we read something and we take it out of context. For example, if a person was to read the ayat of the Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, La taqrabu salah. Do not come close to salah. But if we do not read the ayah which is next to this ayah of the Quran, which is, Wa antum sukara, when you are intoxicated, you will not feel the entire meaning of this ayah of the Quran. So many a times when we see that if a person is successful in this world, you will not be in the akhirah, doesn't mean that you cannot become successful. The way to define success is what? If you define success as wealth, then there was no individual who was as wealthy as Abdurrahman ibn Awf who was amongst the Ashra al-Mubashra, amongst the persons who Rasulullah gave the glad tidings of Jannah. If you speak about success as wealth in which a person has money, then in reality there could be no person who can match Uthman bin Affan anhu, the son-in-law of the Prophet of Allah for who the Nabi of Allah Sallallahu gave two of his daughters, Ruqayya and Umayyikal Tum After one passed away, he gave the second. When the second passed away, Rasulullah Sallallahu said, Oh Uthman, if I had ten daughters, I would have given you one after the other, one after the other. His wealth as so-called success never took him away from the, the, the greatness that Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Taala had provided him for Akhira. As the Nabi of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, I know a name of a man. When he will go in front of Jannah, all eight doors will call his name. He is Abu Bakr. He said, I saw a palace in Jannah which was so beautiful that I became tempted to go inside. And I was told that this is one of the Qurayshis. When I was about to enter, I was told that it was Umar bin Khattab's. Rasulullah said, Oh Uthman, every Nabi will have a Rafiq in Jannah. Oh Uthman, you are my Rafiq in Jannah. Oh Ali, your house will be right next to my house in Jannah. Meaning these were individuals in, in the terms of Uthman of the Allah, the worldly success was there. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala did not, you know, 
make anything wrong in the Akhirah as well. So to say that if a person is successful in this world and they will not be able to have successful in the Day of Judgment doesn't have any reality in Islam itself. Is it possible that Muhammad can come back to reality and guide others to the right path? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has chosen the Nabi Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam as the greatest of the Prophet to ever come on the face of this earth. The Nabi of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam indeed left the face of this earth to Rafiq al-A'la, the greatest of the places where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had made for him. That's why on the day of the demise of the Prophet of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Abu Bakr al-Siddiq radiallahu anhu took the member of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and he said it loudly and clearly. That for those who believe in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala should remember that Allah is there and will remain. And whoever believes and, and, and whoever believes that the Prophet ﷺ, that indeed lo that he has passed away. Ma'ana Muhammadun the ayah of the Quran, in which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions that if you are slain, if you are killed, will you turn your backs towards them? So indeed, as we know that the Nabi of Allah ﷺ left the face of this earth. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has kept this ummah of the Prophet sallallahu for those who can keep on making the effort of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. As Mufti was saying in his talk, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave him spiritual you know, progeny and lineage. That, 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 that the followers of the Prophet of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, as in Europe, the biggest name, which is the most common name amongst the people, became Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. People wanted to disgrace the Nabi of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. They wanted to shun the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. But of course, the haq you know, always becomes uh, you know, dominated over the others. How did the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam behave with the children? Inshallah, we shall cover this. How did the non-believers think about the Prophet of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam? This is also something which will be covered, but very quickly. The Prophet of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was known as Sadiq al-Ameen, the most truthful, the most trustworthy. He was the individual who was loved by everyone. But when the Nabi of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam started the effort of Tawheed and the oneness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the day when the Nabuwat was given and he went to invite the people towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the same individuals who truly loved him, all of them went against him. And the same individuals who called him Sadiq and Ameen in the same gathering, and I say this to the fathers and the mothers who have children, and especially daughters, that indeed two of the daughters of the Prophet ﷺ were divorced in one gathering. And the only reason was that he was inviting towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He took two of his daughters back in one gathering. And only reason why the two daughters were divorced in one gathering was because he said the oneness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So of course as his treatment from the others continuously became worse and worse, but the Nabi of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam akhlaq and manner and character became better and better and sublime and, and, and better than the others. Should we continue? Where, huh? Where was the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam born? He was born in Makkah al-Mukarramah. How old was the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam's wife? And they were 11 and of course Mufti Sahib elaborated upon this differently. They differed in ages, of course from Khadira radiallahu anha all the way towards the last they had many different ages. How old was Prophet Sallallahu kid? And of course, four daughters and two sons from Khadira al Kubra radiallahu anha. And that's why Aisha radiallahu anha reports, inshallah, we will elaborate upon this tomorrow when we speak about the Prophet Sallallahu interaction with his family. But Rasulullah Sallallahu had four daughters and two sons from Khadira al Kubra radiallahu anha. And one son was known as Ibrahim from Maria Kiptiya, which was near the demise of the Prophet of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Did he ever cry for his children? Yes, he did. The Prophet of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam cried for his children and of course also his grandchildren. It was the time which is the Hadith of Al-Bukhari that Zainab Radiallahu Anha, the oldest daughter of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, called the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and asked that, O Prophet of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, my child is very sick, can you please visit us? The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was busy in the affairs of the people. Second message came, Wallahi, O Prophet of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, my, my child is not feeling well. The Nabi of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam left the gathering, he went to the house of Zainab Radiallahu Anha, he took his grandson in his hand and that child passed away in the hands of the Prophet of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. At this moment, the Prophet of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam began to shed tears. The Sahaba Radiallahu Anhu Majmain asked, O Prophet of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, we thought that you were not supposed to cry. We are not supposed to cry in conditions. So the Nabi of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam at this moment said, indeed these tears are because of the mercy that Allah puts in the hearts of the people. So yes, the Nabi of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi did cry over conditions. And of course, uh, this was the amal of the Prophet of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam as asked in this specific question. Jazakallah khair. So inshallah, right now we will break for Isha uh, Salah. Uh, following Isha Salah, there will be uh, some Quran recitation from uh, the local uh, children of this community as well as um, uh, Hafiz Mahmoud. And following that, we will have our uh, final session by Mufti uh, Farhan, which is titled A Glimpse of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam's 
24 hours, uh, his one uh, general day, what it, uh, what it looked like. So following that will be Q&A part two. And following the Q&A part two will be uh, the dinner. So whatever questions were not answered uh, in this particular session, inshallah, we will try to address it in the next session, inshallah. So everyone, please uh, make uh, ready for Aisha Salah. And Pastor Khan, so everyone, please uh, move forward on this side of the room and make way for the brothers so that they can have space on this side of the room, inshallah. Uh, and also, since the Q&A is going on and the ulama are speaking, I request all the brothers to keep it as quiet as possible while the Khidmat Jamaat is working, inshallah. We will keep going with the Q&A session. And once we notice that the Khidmat Jamaat is all set and ready to go, ready to serve the food, at that time, inshallah, we will um, we will end the Q and A session and begin the uh, begin serving the food, inshallah. So right now, before we start, I just need all the brothers who are standing. I just, I just need you guys to sit down. Brothers who are standing, Abdul Majid, Talha, please come sit, inshallah. Just look like put some, inshallah, you can. Uh, just to, uh, while well, Mufti Farhan Saab is looking through the questions, uh, generally in Q&A we don't answer every single question. Uh, some questions based on the scholars' discretions, uh, they don't answer them. Uh, but we try to answer as many questions as possible. And, uh, do we have any questions here? Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. I think that question, uh, can we have? Can we come back and have a question on? Um, so the first thing is, can we come back in a few months to do a session on wills and estate planning? Inshallah, we can definitely try to do this. I will speak to the brothers who are responsible. We are currently have. We actually we had one program yesterday in Long Island. A close friend of ours is Mashallah, an attorney who actually does Islamic wills, and he actually does a whole a whole presentation. So Inshallah, if anything, we can send him to you, and we can send one of our scholars. Inshallah. They can most definitely come in and speak about um, wills and estate planning as well. Synthetic medicines taking is halal or haram. Usually, uh, for example, if a person is prescribed with a certain medication, and now that specific medication that a person is taking has something which is haram inside of it. So now that's the first thing. That's the first thing to understand the synthetic rulings in it. So now our scholars have debated, and of course they have worked so hard on it. There's a chapter in many books of hadith that is known as Babun Tadawi bin Haram. The word Tadawi means to get cured and medicine through things which are haram. So now there are there's a huge debate regarding the aspects of how we can take medicine and when. So there are two things. For example, if a person has a certain disease and they are prescribed by a physician who is knowledgeable and authentic in their source and they say you have to take a certain medicine and that medicine itself contains things which is haram. And now you look into the market and there is nothing available which is synthetic. Synthetic means that it's made out of material which has no haram source in it. So now if you cannot find any synthetic source, nothing others, except for that medication which is haram, and that's the only thing which is available in the market, the scholars have told and said, yes, you can use that medicine to become cured and save a life. To protect a life, is one of the most important things in Islam. That indeed so much needs to be done to protect one individual's life. So that's why taking medication which might contain haram, but if that's the only thing available out there in the market and there's nothing synthetic, then you will be allowed to take that. But if a person has a medication which has been prescribed and has something which is haram, for example, a person is prescribed to have vitamin D every day. Vitamin D usually contains animal byproducts. Now if a person says, if I look into the market, there is a brand which is cheaper and it's synthetic and it's from vegetable source and there's nothing haram in it. So then it will not be allowed for them to take the haram one. It will be <laughs> mandatory for them to take which is safe from haram and, and, and not the, the, the wrong inside of it. Some sources say Rasulullah had a few concubines. Uh, I just request everyone to lower their voices a little bit uh, so that our voices can be heard and we can concentrate. 
Some sources say Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa had a few concubines such as a slave and was gifted to him. What is the validity of this and is it permissible? Yes, Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa had concubines. Uh, yes, they did have, yeah, and there were slaves. Uh, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa didn't own them. Uh, in the Islamic uh, world, uh, there was there is a permissibility of having slaves. Present day, I believe there aren't any slaves existent in the world um, because the idea of Islam was to bring uh, to abolish slavery and when you have something that is rampant and something that is uh, uh, a common di uh, dilemma amongst your, your, your uh, people it's very difficult to eradicate it right away that is why in Islam if you if you uh, uh, say to the heart tell your tell your wife that you are like my mother's back they say free a slave you break an oath free a slave you expiation of fast uh, expiation of something free a slave Constantly freeing a slave is is uh, advocated in Islam. If Islam advocated slavery, then it, we would not have so much virtue for freeing slaves constantly. And uh, if a person was to constantly with the concubine and she would be impregnated, then that concubine, after the death of the uh, of the owner, would be free automatically. She can never be sold. So it was not that uh, the slaves were treated bad. Uh, even in America, uh, Thomas Jefferson. George Washington, they are all slave owners. All the, the, the people who signed the Declaration of Independence, the, the, the Constitution, they were all slave owners. And uh, you can read about them more in uh, historical books. Um, if a person has a lot of debts and they seek Allah's forgiveness, yes, seek for forgiveness if you have a lot of debts, but you need to pay your debts off. Allah will not forgive you if you have spurred the rights of somebody else. You took money from somebody, you have to pay them back. You can't say that, well, brother, I'm praying my five times prayer, I'm doing the hajjud, and now, mashallah, the other brother's not doing anything else, so Allah likes me more, Allah likes him less. No, it doesn't work like that. You take money from somebody else, you have to pay it back to them, and that is not going to be forgiven by Toba. Uh, generally, any sin you do is forgiven by, uh, you have, there's three conditions. You have to stop doing it. You can't be saying that, you know what, I'm going to stop drinking alcohol. Say, wait, one last beer, YOLO. No, it doesn't work like that. You can't say that at all. The second thing is you have to regret it. You can't be like, oh, you know what, I'm going to stop dating that girl. But damn, she's so funny. No, it doesn't work like that. You got you, you know, you to stop doing it, right? And uh, uh, the third thing is you have to ask Allah for forgiveness. But if you perpetrate a sin against another person, then you have to also ask that person forgiveness. If you don't ask them forgiveness, Allah won't forgive you for that. What is the cause of atheism and the rise of atheism? The problem with atheism is the moment we restricted our children and our youth from discussing their problems and discussing the issues that are rampant amongst them, and we said that, well, beta, no, this is a taboo subject, don't talk about it. Oh no, we can't discuss this. Don't venture your mind there. What happens, they go somewhere else, they go to college, they, hear, they have a philosophy uh, session, the, the, they take philosophy 101, or uh, they, uh, they, go to, they, they talk to some professor, and he says, well, whenever we object about Islam, your scholars don't have an answer to it. And they say, well, the kid thinks, well, that's right. I go to my mom, I go to my dad, I go to my uncles, I go to my local imam, you know, they don't answer my question. Islam must be wrong. And then they become atheists. Otherwise, uh, uh, if, if, we open the uh, open the doors of communication and allow ourselves to speak to our youth and allow them to openly raise questions without judging them. Openly raise questions without judging them. I mean, you had a kid in the time of Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam who became Muslim. A person became Muslim. Ya Rasulullah, I became Muslim, but there's a problem. What's that? I like the ladies. I want. Can you make zina halal for me? If it was us, what would we say? This is zina halal. Show you right now. Shot something at him. You come and ask me about no peace also said no, no no. Psychologically explain it to him. If someone did it with your mother, would it be okay? Your daughter, would you like it? Your sister, would you like it? No, 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 no. Well that girl is somebody's sister. She's somebody's daughter. Think about it. Think about what actions you do. Psychologically explain. It wasn't always hit him in the head and tell him that well it's wrong or don't ask us. You know, so psychologically explaining that uh, uh, opening the doors of explanation will resolve the situation of uh, Atheism. Question: <clears throat> What is the best way to become closer to Allah and the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam? To simply put it, someone asked, one of the great scholars of his time. Someone said, Sheikh, you said, you know, you follow Deen, you follow Deen, you will get closer towards Allah. He said, Where is Allah? So Sheikh gave a very beautiful answer. And this is something which uh, would need some reflection for ourselves. 
he said, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is behind the, the mountain of sacrifice. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is behind the mountain of sacrifice. He's behind Jabla Jahat. The more you sacrifice, the more you become closer towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The more that you strive for the deen itself, the more you come closer towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And of course, how can we bring the love of Rasulullah sallallahu By trying to emulate and to bring any way that we see of the Prophet sallallahu into our lives. Try to implement every single thing that we can of the life of the Prophet of Allah sallallahu into our own lives. Another thing is, how can I see forgiveness for my sin? Mufti sahab already mentioned. And if I cannot stop doing sins, yes, we are not flawless, we are human beings, we are not malaika, and we are to sin. There's a hadith of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said to the Nabi of Allah sallallahu that, oh my Nabi, if there was a nation which never committed sins, and they were to leave the face of this earth, I would destroy them and send a nation who would commit sins and they could ask Allah for forgiveness. Because Allah loves forgiveness. Allah loves when a person asks Allah for forgiveness. You want to make an so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala asks us to ask for forgiveness. So we cannot be sinless. We are human beings. We are to make mistakes. But with all of these mistakes, we need to remember that we need to always turn towards Allah. We cannot let the sins accumulate to the level that we even lose the feeling that we are doing sins. As Abu Hurairah mentioned, when a person commits a sin, a black dot is placed on their heart. If they commit a second sin, another dot, another dot, another dot. A time comes that the entire heart is blackened and they don't even feel the sins to be sins anymore. So we need to realize that whenever we make a mistake, come back towards Allah. Don't delay in making tawbah. Don't delay in asking Allah for repentance. Don't delay in changing. For example, a person wants to change, but they don't do it from the depth of their hearts. A person is in school, meaning public school, they say, you know what, when I get to high school, let me enjoy my life, I'll make tawbah. When a kid is in high school, they say, you know what, let me do my high school, when I get to college, I'll make tawbah. When a person gets to college and he says, you know what, let me enjoy my four years, let me enjoy whatever I have to do, then I'll get tawbah when I get married. When they become married and they say, you know what, I can do whatever I want, let me have some children, then I can make tawbah. When they have children, they say, you know what, let me enjoy. And then subhanAllah, it goes on forever and ever. How to stop ourselves from sins? Easy remedy. They say there was a person who had a store. On top of his store, he had a big sign. He said, cash today, credit tomorrow. People used to come and say, you know what, do you sell things on credit? He says, no, only on cash, credit tomorrow. So the next day, the guy came. And he says, brother, can you give me the thing that you, that you told me that you will give me? He says, brother, read the sign. It says, cash today, credit tomorrow. He says, I came tomorrow. He says, brother, look at the sign. I'm not lying. It says, cash today, credit tomorrow. When the shaitan comes to us and wants to make us do sin, tell him tomorrow, tomorrow, tomorrow. And indeed, this will be the best for us. Delay it as much as you can. And because of this, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will give us coffee and we will become stronger in our iman as well. Questions are like <coughs> children with gin stories. They never end. <laughs> uh, I, I think, uh, do you have any more questions to yes. answer? So you, you just complete your questions. Uh, one other question, of course, uh, some uh, humorous questions and then comes to the serious point. So I'm just going to go straight to the serious question. So he goes on a serious, a serious note, how can we learn to trust Allah's part Allah? So he provides for us and even performs miracles. So first of all, we should realize that we should not trust Allah just for the sake of miracles. We should do and we should please Allah for the reasons of just pleasing Allah. Scholars have mentioned that actions are of three levels of sincerity. The first level of action of sincerity is to do something only and solely for the pleasure of Allah. And the highest level of ikhlas and sincerity is not even doing anything even for Jannah, but doing so that only Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala can become pleased with us. So first of all, we should realize and we should correct our intentions. That anything and everything that I do should only be for the sake of Allah without asking anything back from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because this is the haqq of ibadat of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So now how can we trust Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? This is how the Nabi of Allah sallallahu taught the Sahaba at every moment. And this cannot come into our lives in one day. It has to be done over time. 
The Prophet of Allah وسلم, is inside the cave of Hira, cave of Thawr. Along with him is Abu Bakr al-Siddiq radiallahu anhu. It is the day of Hijrah. The Quraysh have come and followed them all the way towards the mouth of the cave. Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu says, I saw the feet of the mushrikeen while we were in the mouth of the cave. فَقُلْتُ يَا رَسُولُ اللَّهِ إِنَّا حَدَهُمْ نَظَرَ إِلَىٰ قَدَمِهِ إِلَىٰ أَبْزَرَنَا If anyone looks at their feet, they will see us. We are caught, Ya Rasulullah, what should we do? So the Prophet of Allah ﷺ said, مَا ذَنَّكَ يَا أَبَا بَكْرٍ بِثْنَيْنِ اللَّهُ ثَارِثُ Oh Abu Bakr, what do you think and expect from those two when the third is Allah to protect? Jabir radiallahu said, we were coming back from the, 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 the place of Banu Mustalaq. And while we were coming back, the Prophet ﷺ tied his sword underneath the tree and he went to sleep underneath the shade. We went far away to look for shade. We heard a loud scream. We came back and we saw that there was a sword in the hand of the Prophet ﷺ. A Bedouin is standing in front of him. We asked the Prophet ﷺ what happened. He said, while I was sleeping, this Bedouin came. He untied my sword. He woke me up. While there was no one around me, he said, Man minni. Who will save you from me? He threatened the Prophet ﷺ. There was no one around him. And the Prophet ﷺ calmly said, Allah. As soon as he said Allah, he began to shiver, he dropped the sword. And the Prophet ﷺ picked it up. And he says, you tell me who will save you from me now. Meaning in every condition, the Prophet ﷺ told the Sahaba to go back towards Allah. So what we need to do is every condition that we face, yes, it hurts. It hurts. It's hard at moments. But we need to remind ourselves, it is from Allah, it will happen from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Last thing before I finish, I share with you. Ibn Abbas said, I was a young man. And I always say this in the company of our youngsters. A lot of our youngsters go through a lot of depression. College, love, girls, boys, all that stuff. A lot of times there's difficulties. Always remember one saying of the Prophet ﷺ. He said, Oh Ibn Abbas, Oh my son, remember, whatever you received in your life was never there to leave you. And whatever you missed in your life was never meant for you. Whatever you got in your life was never there to miss you. And whatever missed your life was never there to me for you. And then Rasulullah said, The pens have been uplifted and the registers of, of decree has been closed. So to learn to trust Allah again and again. And inshallah, time will come that our trust will become strong with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Oh yes. Uh, inshallah, we have some more questions. We want, inshallah, have time, and we will definitely, inshallah, look into all of these things again. Just a quick announcement I was told to make. <coughs> inshallah, there's a beautiful pro program which is coming into uh, the Connecticut area. Inshallah, uh, Mufti Hussein Kamani, who's a very close friend of mine as well, is from Chicago area. Mashallah, one of uh, the most energetic and eloquent persons that I've seen myself. Mashallah, very, very beautiful brother. Alim uh, Skare, Mashallah. He, inshallah, will be coming and visiting the, state, the Connecticut area. Uh, he's been doing a program called the Prophetic Code, which is run by an organization called Qalam Institute, which is run by Sheikh Abdul Nasir Janda. Uh, also a close uh, you know, acquaintance and, and, of course, our scholar as well. So this program, inshallah, will be, um, um, inshallah, in Connecticut on February 6th. They will be leading the Jummah Salah, inshallah, in your Masjid al Then on the evening on February 6th, inshallah, on Friday from 7.30 to 9.30, he will be in the West Khan University, inshallah. And the next day, which will be February, February 7th, inshallah, will be the seminar from uh, 11 a.m. to 6 p.m. He will be doing in the Belford place, inshallah. So for more details, please meet Brother Imran, Brother Robin, and all the other brothers who have the details for this, inshallah. Please see them individually and they will give you the details uh, of where and when inshallah you can find and of course uh, these handouts will also be given and of course whatever opportunity that we get to sit with the scholars and learn inshallah we should try to definitely take the opportunity from doing so inshallah. Okay, so 929 we are...